Hey everyone, it's Nolan, and in this video, I'll be talking about rocket engine design. So more specifically, what I'll do is I'll build up the fundamental concepts of thrust, of combustion reactions, and of nozzle expansion, and then I'll go into an example of designing an actual rocket engine based on very specific requirements. And so one, I'll be doing that by hand using the equations that we build up in this video, and two, I'll be doing it also using a tool called RPA, or rocket propulsion analysis, which abstracts away a lot of the math that we're gonna be doing. And it's a very useful tool for doing a lot of these rocket engine design problems, and we'll see exactly what that means. So one more thing I wanna mention is that inherent to this subject are a lot of equations. Um, so you'll see on your screen a lot of equations coming up. Um, and to accompany that, I've made a nice little equation sheet that you can reference to follow along. And this has all the equations along with the symbols and their descriptions and their units. So definitely check that out, link in the description for that uh, to follow along with these equations. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it with a conversation about thrust. So what exactly is thrust? Well, thrust is the force that propels the rocket upward towards the sky. At a high level, the thrust force needs to be greater than the force of gravity acting on the vehicle in order for it to move upwards. So the essence of propulsion and rocket engine design is to create this thrust force such that the vehicle can achieve acceleration in the upwards direction. And before we can understand thrust, we need to start with a conversation about momentum. So we'll start with a simple example. Let's say we have a 10 kilogram object moving upwards at a speed of 10 meters per second. And that's at t equals zero. So in the next instance, a piece of the, ma the mass breaks off and we have eight kilograms still moving upwards, but two kilograms moving towards the ground, so the opposite direction at five meters per second. So the question is, what is the speed of that larger mass, the one that is still moving in the upwards direction? So let's take a look. So momentum is defined as the mass times velocity of the object. So initially we have mass initial times velocity initial. And the important concept here is that momentum is conserved uh, in a problem domain. So the momentum initially at time equals zero is equal to the total momentum at t equals one. And so we can set the initial, mom the initial momentum equal to the momentum at t equals one. And so we have two separate objects now moving at two different velocities, but the total momentum is conserved. So we can call the eight kilogram object mass number one, um, moving at a velocity v1 plus the two kilogram object m2 moving at velocity v2. And so with this, we can solve for uh, our unknown, which is v1. And so we say 10 times 10 equals eight times x, that is the unknown, the velocity upwards, plus two kilograms times negative five. And I say negative because the velocity is downwards, the speed is going down. And so if we solve for x here, we get 13.75 meters per second. So notice that this object, the eight kilogram object, is now moving at a faster speed upwards with that piece that detached moving downwards. And that is the essence of rocket propulsion. We'll see how that applies to the rocket. So if we look at an actual rocket, we'll see that it's very much the same type of problem, right? We have what, this one large mass at time equals zero, and that encompasses both the structure of the rocket and the propellants in it. And we'll say that at t equals zero, the vehicle is not moving, it's on the ground. At t equals one, we essentially ditch this small differential element of propellant out of the bottom of the rocket. So we're spitting out this piece of propellant, it's going at some velocity greater than zero out the bottom, so towards the ground. And we know from the previous example that ditching this small piece of mass will cause some kind of acceleration of the vehicle in the other direction, right? So at t equals one, the vehicle is now moving at some speed greater than zero upwards because it has ditched this piece of mass that originally was part of it out of the bottom. At t equals two, we have the same thing. So we're ditching even more mass out of the bottom and that'll cause the vehicle to accelerate even more. So it'll reach an even higher speed uh, by throwing out this piece of propellant from the bottom. And so if we take the continuous case of continuous expulsion of propellant out of the bottom, then what we get is some acceleration of the vehicle upwards. And that is the acceleration that the vehicle experiences in order to fly. And so we'll see what the map looks like for that. All right, so thinking back to our momentum equation, what we'll see here is that at t equals zero, the total momentum of the rocket is equal to zero, right? Because it's moving at zero meters per second, which means the mass times velocity of the vehicle equals zero. 
Um, so you're thinking about conservation of momentum, what that means is that at t equals one, when things are moving in opposite directions, the total momentum is still equal to zero. Uh, so we can express that as mass of the rocket times velocity of the rocket equals mass of the propellant leaving. So this is actually a negative here, um, times the velocity of the propellant leaving out of the bottom there. And so what we're really interested in here is what's happening over time. And so we'll actually take this differential time element uh, of this momentum equation. And so what that results in is mass of the rocket times differential velocity of the rocket over time equals negative dm over dt, so differential mass element, um, times the velocity of the propellant. So what you'll notice here is that this term is actually an acceleration term, right? Velocity over time comes out to uh, an acceleration. And so we can express that as mass of the rocket times acceleration of the rocket equals um, this term. And so this term is a mass over time, which is called a mass flow rate. And the way we express that um, is with m dot. So m dot is a notation for mass flow rate, uh, which is what this is, mass over time, kilograms per second in SI units times the velocity of the propellant. Okay, cool. So what we see on this side, though, is that this is actually a force term, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. And so we'll express that as a force acting on the vehicle equals m dot times uh, velocity of the propellant. So I remove the negative here because this velocity term will always have a negative since it's pointing down. And so we can just uh, plug in a positive speed value for that exhaust gas, and uh, that'll always cancel out the negative. And so this equation is our thrust equation, right? Um, the force here is the thrust force, and it is directly related to the mass flow rate of the propellant out of the bottom times the speed at which it's going. So if you look at equation number eight on the equation sheet, that is the full thrust equation that we kind of just derived. Um, so you'll notice that there's this additional term that has to do with the pressures of the gases leaving the nozzle, but for an ideally expanded nozzle, uh, which is the type of nozzle we'll be designing and we'll be talking about, uh, we can cross this term out and we get the very simple thrust equals mass flow rate of exhaust gas times the velocity at which it's leaving the rocket. Um, so you can see with this equation that some, like a very important part of this is the velocity of our gases, of our propellant um, leaving the bottom of the rocket. And so, in fact, uh, an important measure of efficiency is called specific impulse, and that is directly related to the velocity that you can achieve uh, of these gases leaving the rocket engine. And so the question is, how do we get such high gas velocities? Right for reference, um, the exhaust gas velocities of a lot of rockets are between two and 3,000 meters per second. So where, do we, where does this velocity come from? How do we achieve this velocity? Well, a better question is, where do we get this kinetic energy, uh, right? And you can think of rocket engine design as a conversion of different types of energy. Uh, so the kinetic energy is directly a function of the velocity, and that is the energy that is propelling the rock, rocket upward as it gains more potential energy uh, leaving the, the Earth's surface. Um, where does it get, where does this kinetic energy come from, right? Um, it's a, well, it's a conversion of energy. It starts as chemical potential energy of the propellants as they're stored, and then they make their way to the combustion chamber and what happens is through a combustion reaction, we can com or convert that potential energy into heat energy. Uh, and that's the combustion reaction that we're gonna be talking about in a second. Uh, and what's happening there is that we have a very hot reaction and as the gases that form from that reaction cool down, it's speeding up and being converted into kinetic energy that, as it leaves out of the bottom of the nozzle. So we'll be talking about combustion next. How does this reaction exactly convert potential chemical energy into the kinetic energy. So combustion is a reaction that occurs between a fuel and an oxidizer and releases exhaust gases that are formed from these two molecules, as well as a large amount of heat and light. So like a regular burning fire is a combustion reaction. A different type of combustion reaction would be the one that's occurring in our rocket engine and we'll see specifically how that works. But generically speaking, uh, combustion usually occurs between a hydrocarbon, so that's some molecule that's a combination of carbon and hydrogen atoms and regular oxygen uh, or just air. So this is 
uh, here we have just oxygen, but the air will contain O2 as well as N2. Um, so combustion with air uh, also contains nitrogens. Um, but you can see here, it's very generic because uh, we have the hydrocarbon as some amount of carbons paired with some amount of hydrogens. So some examples of those would be methane, which is CH4, propane, C3H8, ethanol, um, C2, I mean, you can see it here. And then so cellulose, which is the main molecule in uh, wood and paper, um, is also some combination of hydrogens, uh, carbons, and oxygens. And so these react with oxygen to form CO2 uh, vapor, and H2O vapors, or CO2 gas and H2O vapor, uh, as well as heat and light, depending on the ratios of the um, hydrocarbon to the oxidizer, you'll also get different um, exo or different product gases uh, that are some combination, again, of hydrogens, oxygens, carbons, and if you're with air, then some nitrogen molecules as well. Um, and so a specific example of this type of reaction is between methane and oxygen. And here you see that one methane molecule reacts with two oxygen molecules to form a CO2 molecule and two H2O molecules as well, again, as heat and light. And so what's important here is the amount of each molecule, right? So for conservation of mass, uh, here you need two oxygens to uh, com have a complete reaction where two uh, water molecules are formed. And so, this ratio of um, ox oxidizer to fuel, the ideal ratio for complete combustion is called the stoichiometric ratio. Uh, and so here the molecule-wise the molecule -wise stoichiometric ratio would be two to one. Um, and then if you actually solve for the masses, you get a mass-wise stoichiometric ratio. And that's an important concept uh, for combustion. So again, uh, this is methane and oxygen forming CO2 and H2O. And these are the gases that are gonna be leaving our nozzle after the combustion reaction. So looking back at our energy diagram, the question then becomes, how much energy is released from this combustion reaction? So a similar question is, what is the temperature of the product gases after the reaction? And these are related because heat energy is directly related to the temperature uh, of the reaction. And so knowing this is gonna allow us to move forward with, de with designing a nozzle that most effectively converts that heat energy generated from the combustion reaction into useful kinetic energy for propulsion. So when talking about energy in the context of chemical reactions, an important thermodynamic quantity that we're concerned with is called the enthalpy. So enthalpy has units of joules and is therefore a measure of energy, uh, can be thought of as the total heat energy of the system, and it is a combination of the internal energy of the system plus the pressure times volume of the system. So what's important to note is that you can't directly measure the enthalpy of a system, but what you can measure is how the enthalpy changes when you change the system either by applying some kind of heat energy to it from an external source or by initializing a chemical reaction such as a combustion reaction. So again, it's more important to know how enthalpy changes uh, when you change the system than it is to know exactly what it, the instantaneous enthalpy is. Another important concept is that if heat energy, if a reaction takes in, absorbs heat energy from its surroundings, then its enthalpy increases. Uh, the system's enthalpy increases when it absorbs heat energy, and uh, a system that releases energy experiences a de decrease in enthalpy. So a combustion reaction, actually, the, like the system experiences a decrease in enthalpy because it is releasing energy to its, sur its surroundings. Um, and that's called an exothermic reaction. Um, combustion is a great example of that. So here you can see one of these tables uh, for thermodynamic properties of air. Uh, these table, a lot of these values are tabulated, um, and this column H right here is the enthalpy. Uh, so enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram. Oftentimes you'll see it expressed as in per per unit mass or per uh, unit molecule. And so you can see here that as the temperature of air changes, the enthalpy increases um, alongside the, the increase in temperature. And so this is saying that the air has a higher enthalpy uh, when the temperature increases. And this makes sense with that notion of applying heat energy increases the uh, enthalpy. Something else that's important to note is that we're, we're often concerned with the enthalpy relative to some standard state. And so we take the standard condition to be uh, at pressure of one atmosphere and at 25 degrees Celsius. So if this table continued, that would be at a temperature of 298 Kelvin. And the enthalpy associated with that can be thought of as the standard state enthalpy of air. And usually that's denoted with this little 
a degree symbol as the standard condition. When we talk about the enthalpy of a compound substance such as air, which is formed of various different molecules with different atoms, what we're talking about is the sensible enthalpy of the system. So this is describing how the bulk sum of the substance with its different molecules is affected by changes in energy or reactions uh, using that substance. Um, in contrast, another important concept is the enthalpy of formation. So the enthalpy of formation relates to a particular substance and describes how much energy is released or absorbed when one molecule of that substance is formed from its constituent atoms at those standard conditions we talked about. So 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure. So here's an example of CO2 formation at the standard conditions. So we take in one molecule of carbon at standard condition and a molecule of O2 at standard condition and form a CO2 at those standard conditions as well. And so the energy released in this process is called the enthalpy of formation of CO2. And you can see that the enthalpies of formations for various different substances have been tabulated uh, in tables like these, where you can quickly see um, what value corresponds to what substance. Something you'll note here is that some of these enthalpies of formation are positive. And what that represents, uh, a positive enthalpy of formation, means an endothermic reaction where energy is absorbed by the formation of the substance. And in contrast, a negative enthalpy of formation means energy is released by the formation of the substance. So in our example, we use CO2. Here you can see the negative enthalpy of formation. Last thing you'll note is that some of these are at zero, and these correspond to the, all the elements in their stable state. Uh, right? We need some reference point at which to start this. Uh, you can't form carbon from any simpler atoms. Uh, same thing with this hydrogen in its stable state of H2. Uh, these start at zero and form the basis for forming these other enthalpies of formation upwards from there. So what we can do with these two different enthalpy terms is come up with the total enthalpy um, of the substance by adding up the enthalpy of formation at those standard conditions to the sensible enthalpy relative to the sensible enthalpy at those standard conditions, which is what this subtraction is here, right? Making it relative to standard conditions. And what the bars in these enthalpy terms represent is that we're talking about kilojoules per mole as opposed to just the pure energy term. So we're talking on a per mole basis, the total enthalpy uh, can be summed up as the enthalpy of formation plus the sensible enthalpy relative to standard conditions. And this is gonna be very useful for determining the temperature of our reactions. So for any chemical reaction, such as combustion, the conservation of energy law applies. So simply put, what that means is that the energy going into the system is equal to the energy out. So for combustion, we can express this this way. The energy in comes from the enthalpy of the reactants, and their energy out comes from that heat uh, released from the reaction, as well as the enthalpy of the products. Don't forget that there's still energy contained in those product gases, so these together form the energy out. So not all reactions uh, release heat energy, some of them, as we mentioned, absorb energy. So more generally speaking, we can express this as Q being the heat uh, either released or absorbed equals the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. So back to our CO2 example, you can see that energy in uh, and the arrows are a useful way to distinguish between energy in and out. The energy in here is formed from the reactant enthalpies uh, and the energy out terms come from the heat uh, released by the reaction, and that is this number right here, and, as well as the enthalpy of the product, which in this case is CO2. So to write this out more explicitly, we can see that expanding on, this, uh, on these enthalpy terms, we can express them as the sum of the individual enthalpies of all of the reactants and the products. Um, so we've seen this term and what the N here represents is the coefficient in that mass balance equation that we looked at earlier. So if we have two oxygens uh, and one methane, which was the example we had earlier, we would sum, we would put a two here and sum the enthalpy of the oxygen to one for the enthalpy of that one uh, methane. And the same applies for the different product gases. All right, I know that was a lot, but now we can bring it back to our actual rocket. And so what we have here is a combustion reaction occurring in the combustion chamber where the reactants into this reaction are our propellants, right? Our oxidizer and our fuel, which we store in the rocket. 
So on the other hand, the products of this combustion reaction are those hot exhaust gases that will be then leaving the nozzle at the bottom of the rocket at those super high velocities that give us the thrust we talked about at the beginning. And so what we're interested in knowing is the temperature of the reaction, the temperature of these gases right after the reaction, because that'll tell us a lot about how they're going to behave uh, further downstream than nozzle so that we can then design an optimal nozzle um, to expand the gases perfectly and get the highest velocity out of the bottom. In order to find the temperature of our product gases, we'll start with the energy equation and take the limiting case where there is no heat transfer uh, from the reaction into the surroundings. And so this is called, for that reason, the temperature that we are going to find is called the adiabatic flame temperature because there is no heat transfer to the surroundings from this reaction. And so what this assumption essentially means is that we're assuming all the energy released by this combustion reaction is going into the products to heat, up, heat them up and increase their enthalpy as opposed to leaving the system in the form of heat. So when we simplify this, we get that the enthalpy of the reactants equals the enthalpy of the products. And expanding this, we get the explicit term uh, involving the different enthalpies uh, as well as those coefficients in the mass balance equation. And so what we know here is the temperature of the reactant. We can roughly estimate what temperature uh, those propellants are when they enter the combustion chamber. Um, and we're going to find the unknown, which is the temperature of the products. So remember that these other terms, uh, the standard condition terms, are constants and can be found in the tables, uh, whereas the uh, sensible enthalpy term is relative to or is a function of temperature. So we know the temperature at the input, and we're going to try to find the temperature that the um, product gases would be at in order for this equation to make sense. Okay, so for our particular example, we'll be trying to find the adiabatic flame temperature of a propane air combustion reaction occurring at 25 degrees Celsius. So the first thing I'll do is write out our chemical equation so that we can find the relative amounts of these different molecules for a full combustion reaction. So in terms of the reactants, the first thing we have is C3H8, which is propane, and that's our fuel, followed by our oxidizer, which in this case we're using air, which can be expressed as O2 plus 3.76 N2. And these will react to form some amount of CO2 plus some amount of H2O, followed by some amount of unreacted nitrogen. So the next step is to find these coefficients in order for the masses to be conserved on either side. And we can start by saying that there will be one propane molecule in this reaction. So notice that propane has three carbons and it is the only molecule in the reactants with carbon. So what that means is that on the right side, there must also be a total of three carbons for mass to be conserved. And so we see that CO2 is the only molecule with carbon and there's only one of them in there, which means that the total amount of CO2 in the products must be equal to three. So on a similar vein, we see that propane has eight hydrogens, contains the only hydrogens on the right side, which means there must be a total of eight hydrogens on the, on the right side, sorry, the eight hydrogens on the left side. And what that comes out to is four uh, H2O molecules on the right side. So what we've done here is constrain the amount of oxygens as well on the right side to a total of 10 oxygens, which means there must also be a total of 10 oxygens on the left side. And to do that, we can write that there's a total of five air molecules. And so finally, what that determines is the amount of nitrogen on the right side. We just multiply five by this 3.76 and we get 18.8 nitrogens on the right side. So great, now that we've found the relative amounts of these different uh, molecules, we can move on to find the temperature by using our energy balance equation and the different enthalpies. So writing out our energy equation, we get that the sum of the reaction enthalpies equals the sum of the product enthalpies. And when we talk about enthalpy, remember we have our enthalpy of formation at standard condition and on a per mole basis, uh, plus the sensible enthalpy at some reference temperature, which in this case is our initial temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, minus the sensible enthalpy at standard conditions, just so that everything is relative to standard conditions. Um, and these are our reactants. So on terms of the products, we have the same thing, heat of heat or enthalpy of formation of the products, uh, plus the sensible enthalpy at some unknown temperature, we don't know yet, minus the sensible enthalpy at standard condition, and this is for the products. So looking at this, let's see what we know and what we're trying to find. The ends here 
correspond to the coefficients of the products and the reactants in the mass balance equation. So this is known and this is known just based off that mass, mass balance we just performed. Remember, all of these standard condition enthalpies are known values that are tabulated in uh, those tables. So these are constants that we know. We know the heat of formation for all of these different molecules, all of these different reactants, and we also know the heats of formation for all of these different products. Similarly, we know the sensible enthalpies at standard condition um, for these different reactants and products, and these, again, can be found in the table. So we know this, and we know this. And based off the problem statement, we know the sensible enthalpy at our initial temperature, uh, this term. And so we know we're at 25 degrees Celsius, and this happens to be the same, this happens to be the standard condition. So for this particular example, these two terms will cancel out, and we know, um, essentially we know this based off our initial conditions. So what we're really trying to find here is this sensible enthalpy term for the products and to break it down further, um, we're trying to find the temperature at which all of these sensible enthalpies for the different products actually come out to something that equals the right side of the equation. Okay, so I've gone ahead and tabulated these different enthalpy values based on the tables. Again, these you can find these on the internet. Um, just make sure the source you're looking at is trusted or in any thermodynamics textbook, usually a lot of these values are tabulated in the back. And so, we have the different heats of formations for the molecules um, of relevance, as well as the sensible uh, enthalpies at standard conditions, so 298 uh, degrees Kelvin. And so now we can proceed with solving our equation. So on the right side, we have one kilomole of C3H8. And again, the one was derived from here earlier. And so our heat of formation is negative 103,850 and plus our heat or our enthalpy at the initial condition minus the enthalpy at standard condition. And for this particular example, I've chosen the temperature such that these are equal, which means we can just ignore these, they cancel out. So also on the right or left side of the equation is the oxygen. And remember, we said we have five moles of oxygen and the heat of formation for oxygen. This is a simple element in its simplest form, so it's going to be zero. Same thing with nitrogen. We have 18.8 .8 moles of those, but this also comes out to zero. So these terms can be completely disregarded. On the other side of the equation, this is where it gets interesting. We have our products. So we said there's going to be three moles of CO2. And plugging in the heat of formation, we get negative 393,520 plus our unknown, which is the sensible enthalpy at this final temperature that we don't know yet, of CO2 minus the sensible enthalpy at standard condition, which looking at this table, it's going to be 9,364. So similar thing for water, we have four moles of those, H2O, our heat of formation from the table is 241,820, and then again, we don't know uh, this sensible enthalpy in the final state because we don't know the temperature yet, and this is where we're going to find, so this is another unknown, uh, and then minus our sensible enthalpy at standard conditions. And then finally, we have the nitrogen. So a lot of nitrogen, 18.8 moles of nitrogen. And again, this is a simple element um, with just formed from one uh, distinct element. So that is an enthalpy of formation of zero. And then again, we have this unknown sensible enthalpy for nitrogen minus the enthalpy of formation of nitrogen. Or enth sensible enthalpy at standard conditions is 8,669. And so if we solve all of this, what we end up with is 2274675 kilojoules per kilomole uh, equals the three enthalpy CO2 plus four enthalpy H2O plus 18.8 
sensible enthalpy of nitrogen. And so here it looks like we have three different unknowns uh, that might make it difficult to solve it. But remember that we're gonna assume all of these product gases are at the same temperature, uh, which means we really only have one unknown, which is the temperature. And one temperature will result in these three different sensible enthalpies in our, at our final state. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll try different temperatures. We'll start by guessing a certain temperature, uh, determine based off the tables, the different sensible enthalpies for our products and see if the equation actually makes sense and equates to this uh, amount of energy, total amount of energy that we have on the right side. Okay, so here the first temperature I tried was 2200 Kelvin. And by looking through the tables, uh, I determined the sensible enthalpies if all of these different products were at 2200 Kelvin. And these were the numbers that uh, I got from the tables. So adding those up, we get around 2064929 um, kgs per kmol, which is pretty close, but still a bit less than that 2274675 from the left side of the equation. Uh, and so what we'll try next is increasing the temperature a little bit to um, try to find a better approximation for those product temperatures. Okay, so the next temperature I tried was upping it up a little bit to 2400 Kelvin. And again, I looked through the tables to get all these values for that particular temperature. And so adding it all up, we get 2280608, which is approximately equal to that 227 that we're trying to find from the right side. So you can do an interpolation to find a, the exact temperature, but it's close enough that we can say um, the temperature is approximately equal to 2400 Kelvin. Um, of our product gases. And so this is actually equal to 2127 um, degrees Celsius. And if you look up the adiabatic flame temperature of propane with air, you'll see that it's around here, not exactly this number, because we made a few, uh, a few approximations, including this 18.8, uh, not being a round number at the beginning, but this is close enough. And so you can see that through this process of iterate, iterating through different temperatures, um, and solving for the respective enthalpies, we can determine approximately what temperature the product gases will be at. So one more thing I wanna mention is that in reality, solving for the temperature of a combustion reaction in a rocket engine is pretty complicated and not as simple as the example we just did. And so the main reason for that is that for rocket engines, we tend not to use that perfect stoichiometric ratio of oxidizer to fuel for reasons we'll talk about later. And what that does is it really complicates the right side of the chemical equation. Instead of just having H2O and CO2, that unperfect amount of um, fuel to oxidizer is gonna cause other reactions uh, and other products to be formed other than just uh, CO2 and H2O. So those include carbon monoxide, um, just atomic hydrogens, um, and then a few other things. And each term that you add to the right side is gonna severely com complicate the equation and solving for the mass balance can get pretty atrocious. And so instead of doing all those calculations by hand, we use tools that exist um, called chemical equilibrium solvers um, that are kind of do all these calculations for you and can output um, based off like the ratio of oxidizer to fuel that you're using, they'll output how much of these different uh, byproduct gases you're getting as well as the temperature of the reaction for you. And so the one we use is called RPA, Rocket Propulsion Analysis. Again, we'll talk more about RPA in a bit, but there are others out there like NASA's Chemical Equilibrium Solver, CEA. Um, and I think there's others out there uh, that perform a lot of this math for you so that you don't have to do it by hand. So at this point, this video is getting a bit long. So what I'm gonna do is split it up into two parts and end the first part here. And so in the next video, we'll talk about the nozzle expansion process. So what is actually happening to our gas as it expands right after that combustion reaction and it goes through the nozzle all the way to the exit. So we get useful kinetic energy. And then after that, we'll go into a specific design example. Um, so starting off with some design requirements, we're gonna design a nozzle, figure out the shape and size of that nozzle for ideal performance. And so stay tuned for that video. I hope you learned something from this one. This one is a lot about the fundamentals behind what's happening uh, behind the engine design process but nevertheless very important when you're walking through these steps to know why it is that certain decisions are made so again hope you enjoyed this video but keep an eye out for the next one um, more info to come